Hey everyone, so I've been getting a ton of questions about the potential use of molecular hydrogen for the COVID-19. Now, there does appear to be some good rationale for why it would be used, and in fact in China there are already several clinical studies where they're using molecular hydrogen to treat the COVID-19 patients. According to some of the researchers, the preliminary data is really quite promising, insomuch that at least one governmental organization is now recommending the use of molecular hydrogen for these patients. Now, I want to go through the pathophysiology so I can describe the rationale for why hydrogen gas would be used in these clinical studies and in this scenario. But first, I want to show you a video where Dr. Nanshan Zhong, who was the one who discovered the SARS coronavirus in 2003, actually recommends and discusses the use of molecular hydrogen. And then I actually have some videos where patients who have the COVID-19 are actually describing their experience using the molecular hydrogen therapy. So we'll go to those videos and then I'll come back and talk about the rationale for H2. So we'll see you soon. We just uh, finished uh, some of the data from three hospitals. We use the uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen mix. Yes, yes. It seems to be working very well. I am happy about that. So I just got the data right now. So from Wuhan and from uh, from uh, Guangzhou and three hospitals all together, 60 something. And after inhaling this uh, hydrogen and oxygen mm -hmm. mix air, uh, gas, they improve, the dipsnia improve the second day and the third day and the fourth day. So all, all of them showing really improved. I suppose because of as, as, at least uh, resist uh, mm -hmm. to, to reduce the mm -hmm. airway resist uh, that gas resist airway resist. So mm -hmm. much easier to go into the alveolar to improve the oxygenation. I think that's a good way. <laughs>感觉很舒服很舒服是不是啊有什么不好的感觉啊有没有说觉得胸口很就是吸了之后感觉很顺畅啊或者是吸气吸气的时候觉得就是很顺一点感觉对原来一深呼吸呢嗯不会咳
and it causes viral replication and, re and make more viral particles and everything. And then this type 2 pneumocyte is then going to release these, these mediators to recruit these macrophages. And the macrophage, uh, the white blood cells, are going to release these various cytokines, okay, interleukin-6, interleukin-1, um, TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. That's going to go into the plasma and, and then it's going to release uh, neutrophils. Now it's going to increase some of the vasodilation permeability so that neutrophils are going to now go into there. It's going to start creating a reactive oxygen species and the reactive oxygen species are very damaging oxidative molecules that are going to, you know, kill the viruses. Well, the viruses are already dead, but, you know, kill everything, inhibit viral replication, um, and, and, and do exactly what we want them to do. So that's a very important uh, part of all of this. Um, but as this continues going, uh, you're going to get more and more of this uh, reactive oxygen species, more of the inflammation, you get more vasodilation, more capillary permeability. But because you actually are destroying your type 2 pneumocyte, well, the type 2 pneumocyte is what's important to make surfactant. If you don't have surfactant, your lungs aren't going to work correctly, um, so, so you're not, you're, you don't have uh, the reduced surface tension. So you have a decreased concentration, plus with the permeability, all the plasma is releasing out into... Uh, the alveolus, and so now you have a collapsed alveolus. So, of course, you have a collapsed alveolus, you're going to have very difficult for gas exchange. Um, you're, 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 you're going to have to work really hard to breathe. So you're going to have a very difficult time breathing um, with that problem. When this, uh, because of all the reactive oxygen species, you're damaging the actual cells. So the whole entire alveolus will end up um, dying. And now you're going to try to be coughing that up, so you have a productive cough, so people are going to present with, with, with a cough and everything. Plus, with the um, interleukin-6, uh, interleukin-1, th these are going to go to the hypothalamus. That's going to control the body temperature. It's going to say, hey, you know, let, let's increase the body temperature. Um, that's going to cause a fever, so now people are going to have a fever. So all this is going to continue getting more and more inflammation. You get this systemic inflammation, so more vasodilation, and that's going to cause lower blood pressure or hypotension. So you're just going to feel weak and fatigue and everything, right? Um, so you have this, this hypotension. Well, that's also going to cause low, low blood perfusion. Well, low blood perfusion, meaning you're not going to get the, the, the oxygen-rich blood uh, to your cells. So that's going to cause low oxygen levels or, or, or hypoxia, right? So now you're going to be uh, short, short of breath, um, plus with this issue, you have short, short of breath, but also here, and that's going to activate the chemoreceptors, it's going to uh, cause you to uh, activate sympathetic nerve activation, so you're going to have a higher heart rate, for example, so you have fever, difficulty breathing, higher heart rate, a cough, all of these things. But you're not getting the nutrients there either. You're not you're, you're not being able to do metabolic waste removal. So that's going to cause cell death, right? Apoptosis, necrosis, autophagic cell death, um, the different pathways of cell death, and that essentially kill enough cells. You're going to cause multi organ, multi system organ failure. Now that's of course really bad. It's like for the lungs, like this is what we're happening. What we're talking about right here. Um, also in the kidneys, you're not getting the right blood circulation. And everything, so your kidneys start having problems. You have higher blood urea nitrogen levels. Um, your liver is also being damaged. You have ALT, AST, all these different uh, tissue damage that's occurring on. And as this continues, you, you you can get ARDS, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now most people who die of say COVID nineteen or other SARS like viruses. They die because of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. Again, it's, it's a disease of the lungs, and that, of course, all this leads to death. So we, we need to stop this, right? That, that's the whole goal. Is what can we do to stop this? And, of course, the um, idea is, okay, how do we inhibit viral replication? How do we um, inhibit all this stuff? How do we get our immune system going? Well, notice that a lot of the damage is occurring here from the reactive oxygen species and this inflammation that leads to systemic, in, in, uh, systemic inflammation. Well, let's, let's zo zoom in on this a little bit and, and understand it, because this is really what's going to help you to understand the rationale between uh, for behind hydrogen gas, rationale for hydrogen gas. Why are they using it in the clinical, clinical studies? Why is it having the effect that it does? Um, it, it helps explain all of this. Okay, so first, reactive oxygen species. Again, these are very oxidizing molecules. Um, well, actually, superoxide is reductive, but 
the point is they cause a lot of oxidative damage, okay? Uh, you cut your apple in half and it turns brown, that's oxidation, that's damage, it's rusting. And that same thing happens to your cells. It causes lipid peroxidation, DNA damage, all of these things. So we don't, we don't want to have an excessive amount of that. But these are also important. These neutrophils, they produce these uh, reactive oxygen species. They, they express these NOx enzymes or NADPH oxidase enzymes. And it takes uh, oxygen, normal oxygen, and it converts it to the radical superoxide. Um, the mitochondria and electron transport chain also produces as a source for superoxide production. This is also very important. Superoxide is, is what is Again, you know, killing the pathogens, killing all, all the bad stuff and, and helping you. So you really want superoxide. You just don't want too much of it. It's got to be regulated, right? Um, uh, also, nitric oxide. Well, nitric oxide is very critical. It's a vasodilator. Of course, that's really good. Um, but you don't want too much of that because that's going to cause you know, just, um, misdistribution of blood flow and whole sorts of problems. So we need to have that regulated as well. But nitric oxide, is, it, it, it can inhibit bioreplication. It's extremely important for the immune system. But again, you don't want too much if you want to keep that regulated. Well, when you have this cycle going on, these are just getting higher and higher and higher and higher. And now you're just causing all sorts of uh, necrosis and cell damage. You're inducing apoptosis, right? That's the cell death we talked about. Well, also when these get high, they react instantaneously to form none other but peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite is literally like the most oxidizing, damaging molecule that there is. It is, it is pernicious, it is terrible, it is a bad molecule. And not only, not, not, that, that's a bad one, but then there's also the hydroxyl radical. The hydroxyl radical is actually the most cytotoxic reactive oxygen species. It, it's just bad. Both of these guys are just bad. That, that's why they're in the red color, because red means, well, red means bad in this case. Um, so it, it, when these get high levels, they form peroxynitrite. Peroxynitrite can form the hydroxyl radical. Superoxide can also form the hydroxyl radical through a process called the Fenton reaction. Um, like there's iron and different things, it, it can cause this to catalyze. So the, I, I just want to point out that, that these, these guys right here, they do us no good. We do not want them. They cause cell death and everything. These guys, on the other hand, they're important for our immune system, for our function, everything. So, so we actually like them, but we need them to be regulated, okay? Well, these enzymes... Um, are, are very critical to, to regulate these and they get hyperactivated by the immune inflammatory response we'll talk about over here. So, but, but typically, let's talk about superoxide, for example, the body regulates this because superoxide, um, normally it's just, it w w once it's done its magic, once it's done what it needs to do, it's quickly converted by superoxide dismutase, the body's antioxidant enzyme, it's converted by hydrogen peroxide, that's converted to um, uh, water and oxygen by, say, catalase or glutathione peroxidase. Uh, it's no problem. The body can take care of this. These are our body's natural antioxidants, and they are regulated by what's called this uh, NRF2 keep one system. Okay, so here we have like a cell, and here's the nucleus. Okay, look, here's your mitochondria. Okay, um, but w what can happen is that NRF2 keep one is a transcription factor that when it gets activated, check this out. When NRF2 keep one gets activated, it goes into the nucleus and binds to the ARE, the antioxidant response element, or ERE, the electrophile response element. But here it binds and induces the, 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 the translation, transcription production of the body's natural antioxidants, like your glutathione, your, your catalase, your superoxide dismutase, your glutathione peroxidase. In fact, NRF2 regulates over um, 200 different cytoprotective proteins and enzymes, okay? It, this, is the, this is the phase two uh, enzymes, detoxification and antioxidation. It's all right here with the NRF2 keep one system. Well, when you have an attack like this, all your superoxide dismutase, your catalase, all this stuff that's gonna control everything is like totally depleted. It, it's, it's, it gets gone and that's why you're getting, uh, it gets gone, that's funny. Um, it, it, it's, it's, you get such a depletion going on here that you're quickly gonna have necrosis and apoptosis, cell death and everything. So, so that's why NRF2 is so, so important. Well, look what happens here. So now let's talk about hydrogen a little bit. Molecular hydrogen actually has the ability to activate to activate the NRF2 keep one pathway. 
And when it can activate the NR2 keep one pathway, it's going to help to replenish and maintain that, that redox homeostasis of your glutathione, your superoxide dismutase, your catalase, like I said, over 200 cytoprotective proteins and enzymes. And, and as it does that, it's going to help to maintain this whole thing. Okay, so that's one critical aspect. Another critical aspect is hydrogen can also regulate um, this area over here. It can actually regulate the, the, the NTPH oxidase system. It can actually down-regulate this so you actually get less superoxide production. Um, if, if, there's, if it's too much, for example, it can help bring that down. Uh, as well as regulate the nitric oxide synthase enzymes, has regulation in the mitochondria. Actually, some really neat benefits in the mitochondria that we're, we're, we're finding with the hydrogen gas. Um, so, so here, hydrogen is able to take care of the ROS. Oh, and these guys right here. So, so hydrogen actually can, se can selectively reduce um, th these, these guys, the hydroxyl radical and the perioxy nitride. Okay. Now, now consider, see, other antioxidants, say vitamin C or, or vitamin E or, or which, whichever ones we're talking about, um, there are some potential problems because in, in, in some ways, just based on uh, um, reaction kinetics or, or stoichiometry or different things, not stoichiometry, but uh, those things can react indiscriminately with things like superoxide or nitric oxide. Okay, hydrogen gas... Hydrogen gas can actually not react with nitric oxide or superoxide. The only things it can react with are these very dangerous and very damaging oxidants, hydroxyl radical and peroxyl nitride. It can't react here, but it can selectively reduce these guys. It can increase NRF2 activation to increase your body's natural antioxidants, and it can regulate the enzymes, the very enzymes that are producing these. So it's a very good regulatory system of what hydrogen gas can do, okay? And consider it is a small molecule, smaller than oxygen, so it's able to diffuse into the cell, into, into the cell, into the nucleus, into wherever, um, very easily where it can in, in, ha have these regulations, okay? Okay, so now let's go to the infl in, inflammation, okay? D during this process, we get what's called the cytokine storm. That's when we have just this huge upregulation of all these cytokines, um, and, and we have t t tons of problems going on here, okay? So, for example, interleukin 6, interleukin 4, T tumor cancer factor alpha. Well, these are regulated by other transcription factors like NF kappa B, um, NFAT, STAT 1, or STAT 3. These transcription factors um, regulate and increase the production of all of these. Well, guess what activates these? Reactive oxygen species, okay? Well, reactive oxygen species activate these guys, and guess what these guys c c uh, can produce? Well, if you guess reactive oxygen species, you go to the head of the class, because that's right. All of this is this whole cycle, and you can see it's a vicious cycle. It just keeps on getting worse and worse and worse until you get more cell death, which results in multi-system organ failure, which results in, well, eventually death. If we don't, st if we don't stop this, we have to stop this cycle. So... Hydrogen gas over here, we've actually demonstrated that hydrogen has an inhibitory role or a regulatory role in, in regulating these guys, which are going to regulate the actual inflammatory cytokines. So we, we've, we've actually done several studies showing, uh, m well, we and as well as many other uh, uh, colleagues and researchers, and many papers have demonstrated that hydrogen has a great anti-inflammatory effect, decreasing interleukin-6. Okay, that's a very potent, potent um, pro-inflammatory cytokine. So hydrogen can regulate NFKB, NFAT, it's going to decrease these cytokines, and we're seeing in the research that hydrogen can therefore decrease, for example, lipopolysaccharide-induced hypotension, um, decreasing um, some of these other symptomology here because it's decreasing this inflammation, it's decreasing the oxidative damage, the oxidative stress that's going on. So, it, 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 so to sum it all up together, this is how the virus progresses leading to reactive oxygen species and inflammation, that's gonna cause all the way to cell death, multi-system organ failure, and eventually, potentially death, right? And hydrogen gas, being a very simple, small molecule, we're showing it's, it can help to regulate the redox uh, status of the cell by uh, selectively reducing the very bad guys, help to regulate and improve the NRF2 keep one pathway to maintain our body's redox homeostasis, and also has regulatory effects with the inflammation to lower uh, chronic, harmful systemic inflammation. And it's by regulating everything and not just decreasing it or, or, or um, inhibiting it or something, because that's not what we want to do. We need, we need all of these things. This is our immune system. We don't want to just get rid of it. Yes, it is what is killing us, 
but it is also it is also very important that we that we have so that we can get better. So that is kind of the that, that is the idea between hydrogen gas and its, its rationale for for COVID nineteen. So anyway, I, I hope this made sense. I hope uh, you're able to learn something from this. And um, we'll, we'll, like I said, you know, check out the literature. We'll post the clinical trials. You know, when they get done. And uh, thank you very much.